CSIRO acknowledges the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast was created. We pay our deepest respects to elders past and present and to First Nations scientists, storytellers and listeners. I think the character of Data from Star Trek Next Generation is probably the most utopian manifestation of what a kind of personified AI could be. Star Trek The Motion Picture. Al from Space Odyssey. The computer that's called intelligence in Team America. What is AI? I feel like it's like an iPod with more personality, maybe. Got a soft spot for the Terminator. Wally, the movie, <laughs> is what I would think of. The big, squishy, white one that's just got a TV series. If you say Al, Baymax, this big marshmallow thing comes to you and helps you with your everyday life. Science fiction and Hollywood have given us many ideas of what artificial intelligence looks and acts like. In some stories, we see the human world taken over by machines, like in The Matrix, or murderous computers like Terminators and HAL 9000 in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Others are friendly, like the helpful C-3PO of Star Wars, or the big-hearted Wally, charged with cleaning up our future planet. So just how close are these characters to reality? And how close is the reality to our everyday lives? Hello there. The Eagle has landed. The CSIRO team. What can I do for you? The machines in the factory. Producing a computer program. The Temperature is approaching 500 degrees Celsius. Beautiful, beautiful. Have answered all your questions. They can provide an attractive solution to tomorrow's energy needs. Welcome to Everyday AI. I'm John Whittle, an AI expert from CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency. I live and breathe AI, and I have to say, my everyday experience of it is a little less dramatic than some of these science fiction stories. But the question that bugs me the most is... When are machines going to replace humans? Spoiler alert, they won't. In this series, we'll explore how AI is being used as a tool to revolutionize everything from healthcare to music, sport, and space exploration. But first, we need to unpack what AI really is, or what it isn't. It's not very cinematic or compelling. Not the robots from TV, not Terminator. It's not something that can walk around and tell you how it feels. Not yet, anyway. It's trying to build with machines, with computers. Incredibly complicated, hyper-specific math. That takes a certain amount of data, analyzes it, and makes some uh, conclusions on it. Somewhat like humans learn, although the learning is significantly different. These voices belong to some of the experts you'll become familiar with across this series. And even amongst them, Defining AI is, well, complicated and sometimes confusing. My aim by the end of this episode is to make things a little easier to wrap your head around and a little less Hollywood sci-fi. When I was 13, I was given a personal computer for Christmas – It cost £99, had hardly any memory, and a rubber keyboard that came unstuck as the glue wore off. But on it, I could play video games, and I loved it. By next Christmas, I asked my parents for a how-to guide for writing computer code, and I was building my own game. A choose-your-own-ending space adventure, where you'd play an intergalactic trader unjustly imprisoned on Earth after your arch-enemy planted drugs on your ship. Anyway... Years later, flicking through a magazine in a careers library, I came across an ad for a Master's of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh. I'd never heard the term artificial intelligence before. It sounded fantastical and like something that could change the world. So I did it, and it eventually led to a job with NASA helping to change our interaction with other worlds. And now I'm here at CSIRO, where we have over 1,000 researchers working across a range of artificial intelligence projects. I can tell you, AI is not some mythical futuristic machine ready to replace us or rebel against its human creators. AI is, in fact, 
already very much part of our daily lives. Let me take you through a Sunday morning. Your phone alarm wakes you up at the optimal time of morning based on your REM sleep cycles. You check the news online. The headlines curated based on where in the world you're reading and the stories you usually read. You're meeting a friend for brunch, so you look up the directions to the cafe on your phone. Your friend is running late, so you check your emails while you wait. It's Sunday. Nothing new in your inbox today. And thankfully, you'll never see all that spam that's been filtered to your junk mail. When your friend arrives, they tell you how their dating app prompted them to think twice about someone they connected with based on flagged words in a private message they were sent. They show you the profile and you think, wow, they look just like that actor from that show. A show that your streaming service recommended for you based on your watching history. But what's that actor's name? Nothing a quick web search won't help find the answer. All that computer-aided stuff, and it's not even 10 o'clock in the morning. In fact, 54% of global consumers are actually interacting with AI on a daily basis. So what's actually going on here? And is this stuff that we've all become so used to really artificial intelligence? We sort of have the assumption that we have natural intelligence, some set of computations that we humans are performing that let us learn as much as we do. And then as soon as you think that, then you could ask, and could we have artificial systems that could do the same thing? This is Alison Gopnik, a professor of psychology and philosophy and a member of the Berkeley AI Research Group at the University of California. I study how children learn and come to understand the world around them. But I've always studied that in the context of thinking about philosophical problems. How could any system come to understand and know about the world? And most recently, in the context of computation and AI. If you described a lot of the recent AI systems in terms of what they actually do, which is that they're large data statistical pattern extraction systems, nobody would get very excited. Nobody would be saying, oh no, the large data statistical pattern extractions are sentient, or oh no, they're going to come and take over from us. So I do think there's been a bit of a a phenomenon that calling it artificial intelligence, you know, going back to the 70s when the term first started getting used, can be a little bit misleading uh, when you're describing what the most powerful current systems actually do. Let's go back in history for a moment to where that tricky term artificial intelligence really came from. In September 1939, on the first day of World War II, a mathematician by the name of Alan Turing took up residence at the wartime headquarters of Britain's top codebreakers, Bletchley Park. He was tasked with decrypting coded messages that the German military were generating with a typewriter machine called Enigma. And he did. Turing created a device he called the bomb that used a combination of machine logic and human understanding to decipher the Germans' encrypted messages. By 1943, Turing's machines were cracking 84,000 of Enigma's messages every month, two every minute. Thanks to this, the humans behind the machines discovered the location of German U-boats who were attacking the Allied forces. Without this code-cracking collaboration between humans and machines, Hitler's army would have had a far stronger footing in the war. And some historians estimate that up to 21 million additional lives could have been lost, or that the war could have dragged on for another two years. After his experiences in the war, Turing began testing out whether computers could learn to do things like play chess. In 1950, he published a research paper entitled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. It starts, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? If humans solve problems and make decisions by using information that we have available, then why couldn't machines do the same thing? 
It's a similar question that compels AI researchers like Alison Gopnik today. You think that that's the general picture, that the brain-mind is doing computations and that those are enabling humans and animals to do all the intelligent things they do, then it's a very natural question to ask what kinds of computations are being performed. And once you ask that question, it's very natural to ask, and could an artificial system, a non-human system, uh, perform the same computations and achieve the same functions? The year after Alan Turing published his Langmark paper, a computer was built that could play checkers and chess. It lost all but one game against a young woman who'd been playing chess for a week. Like anyone learning a game, she would have gradually learnt the rules of each piece, discovered certain tricks, perhaps even begun to understand the psychology of her opponent. Check. The computer, on the other hand, had been taught a mathematical formula. Each piece had a numeric value, and every move could win a specific amount of material. The computer was not very good. But the problem back then was merely that the technology, the computer power, and the data were limited. Nonetheless, it kicked off serious interest and investment into AI, or what we now call the first AI summer. There have been a few of these AI summers. We're currently in the third. And in between them have sat periods we call AI winters, the bust after a boom. When the hype dies down, the funding dries up, and the technology seems to hit a standstill. At the tail end of the second AI winter in 1997, IBM built a chess-playing system called Deep Blue that beat world chess champion Garry Kasparov, who had famously never lost a match. When Garry's human brain was searching through approximately five possible moves a second, Deep Blue was assessing around two million. Checkmate. And today... Millions of everyday people play chess against computers on free apps on their smartphones. This is just one example of how AI features in our everyday lives. And the algorithm or mathematical formula it follows is an example of one of the two ways that AI works today. There's been a kind of back and forth in the history of computer science, the history of artificial intelligence, between thinking that the best way to get an intelligent system is to build a lot in, and thinking that the best way to get an intelligent system is to have the system go and learn from the data around it. And the most recent AI summer, the most recent renaissance of AI, has depended a lot on the learning. And developing new methods for getting systems to learn from data, that's been the real secret sauce that's led to these uh, big advances. We call this secret source of data-driven AI machine learning. But I like to think of it in simpler terms, like food. Perhaps on weekday mornings, you always have a bowl of cereal. On a Friday night with friends, you usually get pizza. Pizza! If you had a big night on Saturday, you're more likely to have a burger for lunch on Sunday. And if you've been hitting the gym a lot, you tend to go for a salad. There are two ways we could build an AI system that could predict the next meal you're going to have for dinner. The first is a bit like the original chess AI players. We give the AI a set of rules to follow. So Monday morning it's cereal, Friday evenings it's pizza, pizza. after the gym it's salad, and so forth. The second way is a bit more like Deep Blue with a little AI computer tracking and learning your behavior over time. Every time you make or order dinner, it makes a note and collects the data. Once it has enough data, it can pick out its best guess of what meal you want based on the time of day or where you are, what you've been doing, or who you're with. We call this second way data-driven AI because it looks for patterns in data. It uses techniques such as neural networks inspired by the human brain. Think about those messenger pop-ups on websites that offer to answer your questions or that you hear on the phone. Hi, I'm Todd, your virtual assistant. How can I help you today? We use voice recognition security. Please say your name after the tone. These AI voices have been trained with huge data sets of language and human speech to make them sound more or less human when they speak with you. Hi, what is the reason for your call today? I'd like to make a booking for dinner. When you answer, the AI system breaks down all the words you say into data that it can understand. 
It then has a go at deciphering what you're asking it and decides the most appropriate answer to give you. There's more AI involved in converting the answer back into sound or speech so that you can hear and understand. Your table has been booked for five people at 6 p.m. Have a lovely time. Here's an AI that's been trained with my voice using recordings from this very podcast. I am the type of AI that's used in facial recognition, streaming services, that same advertisement that keeps popping up, and in chatbots. AI voices are everywhere. In fact, the number of AI voice assistants is expected to hit 8 billion by 2023. Okie dokie, back to the real John now. Pretty cool. This is the kind of technology that dominates AI today. So if we go back to chess for a moment, 20 years after IBM's chess machine beat the world champion, a student called Matthew Lai created an artificially intelligent machine that taught itself to play chess in 72 hours. It did so through deep learning, and it was called giraffe. Rather than relying on a mathematical algorithm to assess the millions of possible moves at every turn, Giraffe had a neural network inspired by the human brain with several layers of nodes that could predict the moves that could be strong or weak and learn from its opponent's moves more like a human player would. Checkmate. So, can machines think? Well, it depends what you mean by think. Certainly machines can mimic some forms of human behavior that resemble simple problem solving. But is this thinking anything close to what we do? And as we continue to develop this intelligence, will machines be able to feel emotion, have desires, and be aware of their own existence, like the C-3PO's and wall es of Hollywood? I've pretty much spent my whole life dreaming about building intelligent machines. What's exciting now is that many of those dreams are turning up in all of our lives. This is Toby Walsh. He's a professor of AI at UNSW Sydney and a fellow at CSIRO's Data61. Unfortunately, most AI movies are, are written for drama and excitement, and they tend to involve a sentient AI, which, of course, we don't have any sentience yet in machines. It's not, not clear if we ever will. With a glint in its eye that's trying to take over the planet. And, and it's, you know, a race between humanity and the AI as who's going to be win. And the, the reality, of course, is that the dangers, the benefits of AI are much more mundane and prosaic than that. And so movies do paint a very unrealistic picture of what we should be worried about and what we should be welcoming in terms of AI entering our lives. Is there any particular depiction of AI in, the, in literature or in, in, in cinema that you think really gets it right, or alternatively one that you think has got it so horribly wrong that you just cringe whenever you see it? There is one movie that I do like, and that's the movie Her. The first thing it gets right is that AI is the operating system of the computer. So all our devices are going to be connected um, seamlessly to each other and to the web. Your front doorbell, our toaster, our cars, um, our lights, everything in our homes, in our offices, in our in our cars are all going to be seamlessly connected. How are we going to communicate with these devices? Well, we're going to speak to them and they're going to speak back to us. Um, and AI, of course, provides the power that understands that speech and speaks back to us. So that was one thing that I think the movie got well, perfectly right was that, you know, this chap buys his latest operating system, this new AI that he then, um, he then somewhat falls in love with. And I think that's the other, you know, the other part that I, I, I liked as well, which it it does describe is that we're going to become quite intimate with it because we're going to be sharing all our secrets, our calendar, all our purchases, all, all our likes and dislikes are going to be known by this interface. And so it's going to know us better than perhaps our spouse knows us. And so people are going to form quite, I'm struggling for a different word, but intimate relationships as we tend to do with, with these sorts of things. Have you ever fallen in love with a machine, Toby? <laughs> no, no, no. Machines are going to be uh, uniquely disadvantaged in that respect because they're not, they're not human. Machines are never going to fall in love. They're never going to lose a loved one. They're never going to die. Machines aren't going to have those human experiences. Let's be really clear here. Machines are nowhere close to being sentient. 
they are certainly not able to fall in love with us or take over the world. And really, AI systems are not that intelligent. Just think of the frustration you feel when that virtual assistant sends you in loops. Can I speak to an operator? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Please repeat your question. Operator. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Please repeat your operator. question. Operator. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Please repeat your question. <laughs> For all the fear that AI can still incite in people, it is certainly not close to reaching, let alone surpassing, human intelligence. The famous linguist Noam Chomsky said that IBM's computer beating a chess world champion was about as interesting as a bulldozer winning an Olympic weightlifting competition. Deep Blue's success had more to do with the power of its computer engine rather than its actual creativity or intelligence. And if we think back to chess, in July 2022, a chess-playing robot at the Moscow Open grabbed and broke the finger of a seven-year-old boy it was matched up against, apparently thinking the finger was a chess piece. Someone once said that asking whether a machine could think was like asking whether a submarine could swim. Here's development psychologist and AI researcher Alison Gopnik again. Look, I don't think artificial intelligence is the problem, but artificial stupidity, of which there is a lot, that is really the problem. So, you know, having a system that's, uh, that's guiding weapons, for example, that is really dangerous and really something that we have to worry about. And we have to worry about all the unintended consequences of these systems being out in the world. But I don't think that's because they're intelligent. I think that's because <laughs> they're not intelligent and the people who are running them and using them are not intelligent. I do have one last cheeky question for you, Alison. I always hate asking my guests to give predictions of the future, but how long do you think it will be before we do have an AI that is smarter than a four-year-old? Well, I think it's unlikely that we would actually want to have an AI that's like a four-year-old. If we want a brilliant, playful, exploratory intelligence that can find out about the world, we actually know how to make those, and it's actually a lot more fun than coding. So the question is, what kinds of intelligent systems could we produce that would be complementary to that kind of human intelligence? Could we design systems that would complement the intelligence that we already have and that would do it in a in a beneficent way rather than a maleficent way. And once we start designing the systems, can we figure out how to control and regulate them in a way that will be positive? Over this series, we'll learn how AI is being used as a tool to complement or collaborate with human intelligence. And we'll touch on some of the ethics and challenges along the way. We'll hear some fascinating stories from AI experts, athletes, astrophysicists, musicians, and more. In our next episode, we're unpacking how AI is producing award-winning music and art, and asking the question, is there anything about human creativity that machines haven't yet learnt? How do you perform music physically that was composed by an entity which has no body, which has no relationship to the body? Um, it doesn't necessarily think about what feels good to play or what's even, you know, possible to play. I'm John Whittle. Everyday AI is a CSIRO series created by me and Eliza Keck. Alexandra Persley is our supervising producer and Jess Hamilton is senior producer from Audiocraft. The Audiocraft production team is Jasmine Mee Lee, Cassandra Steeth, and Laura Briley Newton. We'd love to know what you think, so please subscribe to Everyday AI and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts.